getting all into it. Did anybody find any verses that can prove the resurrection of the Jewish people come at the end? Or, like, I am tending to believe, and, and you missed this last week, but um, I was challenging people to find for me some, even one Bible verse that shows the doctrine that most churches teach that the Jewish people are resurrected at the end, at the second coming, I mean, instead of at the re resurrection rapture, because they're not in the church. So I, last week I gave some um, scriptures and all that showed that they were saved the same way we are. Uh, they had the Holy Spirit. And we're, they're not to be made complete without us. So why do we believe, or why do they believe that the Jewish people aren't resurrected until the end, at the second coming. Nobody found any? I found three that seem to teach, it's a, well, a friend of mine gave these to me when I gave him the challenge. And I'll just go into it real quick because I got news. Um, in Daniel 12, 1 to 2, it says, this is one he gave me. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not ha has happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, uh, what is that talking about? It's talking about the great tribulation. So that's towards the end, towards the second coming. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. And it goes right into verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, to me, that doesn't prove it because it's talking about the great tribulation. And it says, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Delivered, not resurrected. Delivered from what? Delivered from the great tribulation whose names were found written in the book, to go into the kingdom. That's how I see it. And because he, and, and, and I believe that also, because he goes right in, uh, Jesus goes right in, or Gabriel, goes right into the second verse, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth and awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and, all, and contempt. That's, that doesn't happen at the second coming. That goes right into the end of the millennial reign of Christ, when everyone then is resurrected, the second death, there are some will go into life that, that live throughout the millennial reign, that, you know, stay true and, and had faith in Christ, and others to shame and everlasting contempt, the second death. That was it. So to me, that verse didn't prove that they're resurrected at the end of the trip. Uh, another one he said was, Isaiah 26, 19, but your dead will live, Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. It doesn't tell me when. There's no timing in that. Um, and Ezekiel 37, 13 to 14. Then you, my people, will know that I am Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. Again, when is that talking about? That could be like the valley of the dry bones. I'm bringing you back. I'm going to put my spirit in you. You're going to live. You're going to be back in your land. So those three didn't prove anything. And they're the ones mostly used to prove that. And then I thought, because I won the debate, <laughs> <laughs> prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, First Thessalonians. So prove it, you know. So now the news, and I have a, I know last week Mindy told me I went way too long, gave too much information all at once, but I was trying to catch up in Matthew to that verse 30 to get that out of the way so I could go into the fig tree. And, and I have a couple of verses tonight that I want to give to you after the news, but I'm not going to go into a big, long 
thing, but we got to get to it because it's, it's really interesting. So here's the news. As mentioned last week, we're seeing that Russian President Vladimir Putin, 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 yeah. is signaling a major... I'm going to go on YouTube. Yeah. Of course, every week you're going to file that thick on me. <laughs> That's okay. right, they already do. Yeah. Is signaling a, he's signaling a major inter international move that could shift the focus off of Iran's nuclear threat and place enormous international focus and pressure on the state of Israel to disclose and dismantle its own strategic weapons. That's, they started that's doing that. Goal. This will effectively serve to isolate Israel even further. Yeah. For we know that Israel must be alone in order for the focus to turn back to none other than God, Yahweh, in an old covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. So whatever it looks like he's doing, it's coming right along God's yeah. pathway. Mm -hmm. Not that God is causing all the problems. God knew what was going to happen. And this is all outlined as him, his foreknowledge of what was going to happen. So we can see and understand that. Okay, another bit of news. One Israeli newspaper called the Ma'ariv Daily, which can, it's, it's not like the Jerusalem Post or the Haaretz, but I, I read their stuff, which can either, <clears throat> the Ma'ariv can either be a Jewish prayer service and its other meaning is dictionary or learning source, and that's why they call it the Ma'ariv a little bit. He, he Anyway, they quoted a government source saying that Iran already has at least one nuclear bomb. This was the first time this has ever been mentioned, that they have one. And a government source supposedly told them. The source said that Tehran, is that how you say it? Yeah. Tehran has crossed all points of no return and already has its first nuclear weapon, and maybe more. But a leading Israeli Arab affairs analysis, analyst offered a slightly less dramatic assessment, saying that the regime in Tehran was no more than one or two months away from having sufficient 92% enriched uranium to build its first bomb. Whether they have one bomb already or will have one in one or two months doesn't really matter, because all that's happening is that it's drawing us closer and closer to the prophetic blood moons coming at Passover in, on April 15th. Remember the blood moons portend war for Israel. So you, it's, you ever drive down I-83 and here comes a, a merge on ramp and you just know by glancing over you're going to, unless one of you slows down, you're just going to collide. Mm -hmm. To me that's what I'm seeing. Some people say that because this Passover 2014 is coming, uh, that the blood moon will not be visible in Israel, then it means nothing. That's not true. This sign is meant for the world, and it is a worldwide event, if you will. And since every other time there were blood moon tetrads on the Lord's feast days, it meant war for Israel. Note that I call them the Lord's feast days for that's what they are, not really Israel's feast days. That's because the feast days were instituted for the whole world as a story or plan of the coming of the Lord to redeem his creation and to institute his kingdom on earth. As Mindy said a week or so ago, isn't it so awesome, for want of a better word, that Jesus, God, will remain in his glorified human body for all eternity? After all, the Bible is all about a king and his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, another news bit. In other news, the Times of Israel report says, and this is their headline, Mideast Quartet Seeks Israeli-Palestinian Action by 2014. The release statement says, <clears throat> the quartet reaffirmed its determination to lend effective support to the efforts of the parties and their shared commitment to reach a permanent status agreement with the agreed goal of nine months, the group said in a statement released Friday. So there you see that Kerry's 
Remember, we brought this up a month ago. Carrie's nine-month plan is still a go from when it was first announced in August, which took the date right up until April, keeping in mind again the first of the Blood Moon Tetrads on April 15th, Passover. That date does not necessarily mean war will start on that day. It could come before or after it, but it will be within a matter of months either way. What war are we talking about? What are the two prophetic battles in conjunction with one another called? Isaiah 17 and Psalm 83. The oracle against Damascus and the demise of the people of Edom, the Palestinians. The quartet also called on parties, I, I had to laugh when I read this. The quartet also called on the parties to refrain from any action that would undermine trust or prejudged the outcome of the talks and, com and commended the leaderships of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Mahm Mahmoud Abbas and their commitment to remaining engaged in sustained and continuous negotiations to address all of the core issues. I laughed. Why? I said, sure. Netanyahu has been regularly announcing Israel will never back down, that will never leave again, and will defend itself in spite of world pressure, as well as handing out a bunch more building permits in the face of Mahmoud Abbas. For Abbas's part, he continues to call for the annihilation of Israel in speeches and new articles to his own people so much for refraining from any action that would undermine trust or prejudge the outcome. I just thought, what a joke. Okay, another bit of news. Turning to church news. Headlines in Prophecy News Watch were, a global slaughter of Christians, but America's churches stay silent. Mm -hmm. Did anybody read that in the Prophecy News Watch? Christians in the Middle East and Africa are being slaughtered, tortured, raped, kidnapped, and beheaded. One would think this horror might be consuming the pulpits and pews of American churches. Not so. The silence has been nearly deafening. Egypt's cops have uh, battled the worst attack. Then there's Pakistan, Somali, and in Syria, Christians are under attack by the Islamist rebels and fear extinction if Bashar Assad falls. In 2011, an international human rights lawyer testified before Congress regarding the fate of Iraqi Christians, two-thirds of whom have vanished from the country, either murdered or they fled. There has been an expulsion of 850,000 Jews who fled or were forced to leave Muslim countries in the mid-20th century. Keep in mind, there's an Islamist slogan, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people, which means first we kill the Jews, and then we kill the Christians. Is it happening? Yes. Have you heard the churches here speak about it? It appears there's a lack of anxiety, action, or advocacy on the part of the Western Christians. The church seems to be indifferent, while the Jews seem to understand the gravity of the situation the best. I was surprised to read something about Representative Frank Wolf, who's a Republican from Virginia, back in January. He penned a letter, this is a congressman now, I, I give him a lot of credit. He penned a letter to 300 Catholic and Protestant leaders complaining about their lack of engagement. He said, can you, as a leader in the church, help, he wrote? Are you pained by these accounts of persecution? Will you use your sphere of influence to raise the profile of this issue, be it through a sermon, writing, or a media interview? Can you imagine a congressman taking this upon himself? Too bad there aren't more like him. But even so, there have been far too responses. Representative Wolf and Representative Anna Eshoo, who's a Democrat, 
surprisingly, from California, sponsored legislation last year to create a special envoy at the State Department to advocate for religious minorities in the Middle East and South Central Asia. It passed in the House overwhelmingly, but died in the Senate. Imagine the difference an outcry from constituents might have made. The legislation was reintroduced in January and again passed the House easily. It now sits in the Senate and there is no date for it to be taken up. I know many of you were interested in what Harold, <coughs> Harold is here. Harold had to say about the Federal Reserve, where he worked his whole life. And here's another report. This is another news bit. So here's another report that shows why and where all our economic troubles are coming from and heading to. Karen Huds is a graduate of Yale Law School, and she worked in the legal department of the World Bank, holding the senior counsel position for more than 20 years. I, I didn't know any of this. And it, it, I knew some of it, but not, not the details. She was fired for blowing the whistle on corruption inside the World Bank. She was in a unique position to see exactly how the global elite ruled the world. And the information that she is now revealing to the public is absolutely stunning. She says, the elite use a very tight core. You'll, you'll see right through this when, when you hear this. The elite use a very tight core of financial institutions and mega corporations to dominate the planet. The goal is control. They want all of us enslaved to debt. They want all of our governments enslaved to debt. And they want all of our politicians addicted to the huge financial contributions that they funnel into their campaigns. So why, don't this tell you why nobody's doing anything? Our government is shut down. And as far as the coming crisis over the, um, the budget ceiling, uh, passing that or, or not, and that our country will go into default, that's yeah. not going to happen. Debt ceiling. Debt ceiling. That's not going to happen because there is no debt ceiling. There never was. Yeah. Or else we wouldn't be in the trillions of dollars of debt now. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's all this misinformation being fed into you to keep you in fear constantly mm -hmm. and to control you mm -hmm. from it. Anyway, I got off this, off, off this. Um, oh, okay. She says the global financial system is dominated by a small group of corrupt, power-hungry figures oh, centered around the privately owned U.S. Federal Reserve. Oh, man. I, well, now, Harold knows some of those people in there. Mm -hmm. And... The stories that he's told me when we're walking around Israel and all, I hear all this Federal Reserve stuff all the time. And he, and he being a Christian, saw through a lot of the stuff that was going on. And even though he worked there all his life, he had the reputation that he did not approve or he did not put up with or, you know, he was one of the vice presidents. In, in bonds and stuff like that, he said. But he said it was it was a horror story of you know he stuck to what um, the administrative things were that he had to do. But he he knew about some of the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. He had to do that to keep his job. Mm -hmm. I said, did you do anything bad? And he went no. <laughs> of course not. Well, the position he was in, from what he's told me and everything over the years, he wasn't in a position to be calling or to making, um, you know, the decisions and stuff. He just worked selling and buying bonds. Are you talking about Harold? Yeah. Um, okay. Karen Hudds, the person I'm talking about. Oh, I already said that. The elite also own all of the big media com companies, no surprise there, and uses them to cover up its crimes. 
But they don't just control the media and mega corporations. They also dominate the unelected, unaccountable organizations that control the finances of virtually every nation on the face of the planet. The World Bank, the IMF, you know what the IMF is? The International Money Fund. And central banks such as the Federal Reserve literally control the creation and the flow of money worldwide. Isn't this a setup for the Well, it's a setup for the new world it's order. Really it's, sure it's, it's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. And it started a long time ago. It started back in Roosevelt's time. Because he said well, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, even before that. That's what they were talking about. Yeah. Okay. In That's why they killed Kennedy. Oh, yeah. Kennedy's last speech. Yeah. Our government has been hijacked by an elite group of bankers. Boom. He was gone. Yeah. Yep. yeah he was shot. And that was one of his last this. things that he said in public. One of his last speeches. Our country has been hijacked by an elite group of bankers. Those were his words. Yeah. Who and said he was that? dead. Who was dead. Kennedy. Kennedy. JFK. Wow. Yep. Never get some off yet. Well, Kennedy was Catholic. That meant he was not a Mason. No, he was no. the first Catholic And the Masons Catholic are president. the Illuminati. Right. And no. I'm not saying every Mason in every little town and little blue lodge, they call them, are bad. They're not. They do community work like the Lions and the yeah, but uh, it's Bruce and the, I mean, you name it. And These people don't know what's going on. Right. It's a front. George Washington was a Mason. Yes. All the presidents after him. Yeah. And they did. Them. And every everyone that's been a Mason that's become president goes through the little corn and wine series. Yep. We'll talk about that after we turn off the YouTube video because I have some things I want to add. Not okay. And I do have a <laughs> video I would like to just not even talk one week soon and play it for you about that subject. You hear that, YouTube viewers? You have to come in person to hear the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so they're controlling everything, the flow of money. And, and you know, the Federal Reserve, I always thought that was part of the government. It's privately owned. No, now, there's a little thing in there that says that the government has um, control over the, the, the Federal Reserve. But they don't really. They don't. <sighs> so, at the apex of this, it gets better. Yeah. At, if it were worse, how you look at it. <laughs> at the apex of this system is the Bank for International Settlements. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. This central bank of the world is literally immune to the laws of all national governments. It is an immensely powerful international organization that most people have never even heard of. And it secretly controls the money supply of the entire globe. How? It is called the Bank for International Settlements, and it's the central bank of central banks. How you doing? It's located in Basel, Switzerland, but it also has branches in Hong Kong and Mexico. Mexico City. It is, we're going over the news here, you're wondering what we're talking about. Okay. It is essentially an unelected, unaccountable central bank of the world that has complete immunity from taxation and from national laws. Even Wikipedia admits that, quote, it is not accountable to any single national government. Wow. That's Wikipedia said. The Bank for International Settlements was used to launder money for the Nazis during World War II. But these days, the main purpose is to guide and direct the centrally planned global financial system. Today, 58 global central banks belong to the centrally planned global financial system. And it has far more power over how the U.S. economy, or any other economy for that matter, will perform over the course of the next year than any politician does. That's why all this smoke and mirror stuff that you see going on with yeah. our government Dollars. means zilch. Yeah. Totally yeah. mm -hmm. Right. Every two months, the central bankers of the world gather in Basel, Switzerland for another 
global economy meeting every two months. During those meetings, decisions are made which affect every man, woman, and child on this planet, and yet none of us have a say what goes on. The Bank for International Settlements is an organization that was founded by the global elite and that operates for the benefit of the global elite, and it's intended to be one of the key cornerstones of the emerging one world economic system. Is that the Bilderberg Group? Well, they're just a little part. It's, they're part of the Illuminati. I'm, I did not name some of the names because you know some of them, the Rothschilds, uh, mm -hmm. George Soros, and all those people. I mean, you can get a list because you know what? The best secrets are put out in the open and nobody thinks nothing up because it's out in the open. How can it be a secret? The Bilderbergers meet all the time, and, mm -hmm. and and they give, you know, the newspapers. Oh, we're we happy. So Alex Jones is out there. We don't have any more. <laughs> yeah. Alex Jones, I watched him on the internet. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's really got some. We don't give our Yeah. Mm -hmm. people were They'll be dragging him off to a few weeks. This system did not come into being by accident. In fact, the global elite have been developing this system for a very long time. Can anyone say Illuminati? <laughs> With the aim to creating a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, and to be controlled by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements and frequent private meetings and conferences. The Bank for International Settlements exists to systematically transfer the wealth of the world out of our hands and into the hands of the global elite. So how does that translate for us right now? First of all, that's exactly what we have today. That's what's going on today. The goal is control, but most people have no idea that this is happening because the global elite control what we see and hear and think about. Today there are just six giant media corporations that control more than 90% of the news and entertainment that you watch on your television in the United States. CNN. Oh, CNN. CNN is well, that's not, control. Well, that's, that's not yeah, the... That, that, there's so much disinformation. Well, I'm going to give you who they are right now. Number, There's six of them. Number one, General Electric. They own Comcast, NBC, Universal Pictures, and something called, I've never seen, Focus Features. Two, News Corp. They own Fox, Wall Street Journal, and the New York Post. Third is Disney. They own ABC, ESPN, Pixar, Miramax, and Marvel Studios. The fourth one is Viacom. They own MTV, Nick Jr. What's BET? I don't even know what that is. And CMT. And Live Entertainment. Entertainment. Oh. And Paramount Pictures. The fifth is Time Warner. They own CNN. HBO, Time, and Warner Brothers. Yeah, well. yeah, I didn't even have that on here. And six, CBS. They own Showtime, Smithsonian Channel, NFL.com, Jeopardy, and 60 Minutes. <laughs> um, only 232 media executives control the information diet of 277 million Americans. That's one executive for every 850,000 subscribers. And the total revenue for the big six in 2010, was the most recent I could find, was $275.9 billion. No doubt, no doubt today it's more. But where did all of this start? Well, the Illuminati had decided shortly after the Great Depression had ended 
that economic deprivation is not the most effective means to pull the hearts of an entire population toward Jesus Christ, which is a most important goal to bringing in the Antichrist. Why? Because during the Great Depression, many people turned back to Jesus and the church after losing everything. So the Illuminati then set in place a plan whereby they would use the promise of prosperity as a lure to entice people to follow the God of Mammon, as the preacher had repeatedly warned. And nothing chills a heart toward Jesus faster and more effectively than the promise of attaining prosperity. Capitalism. The elite planned numerous economic shocks so they could transform the economy from capitalism to fascism. Is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. A feat they began in earnest in September 2008. Mm -hmm. yep. That ought to bring a smile to your face. Mm -hmm. It's when Jacob turned his whole face to his economy, started bringing in his wealth through the flocks of labor. Flocks and herds of labor. And that's right where we're still at right now. That's the high loss that's there eating donuts. Lehman <laughs> 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 Brothers crash. Oh. <laughs> there was a news article entitled Financial coup completed. American economy now a tightly controlled, severely regulated economy. Fascist, not capitalist anymore. The American economy has now been transitioned into fascism, a fact clearly seen when President Obama fired the CEO of General Motors, an action clearly not possible under capitalism. Is it any wonder how people today are influenced, manipulated, dumbed down, used and abused while never even knowing it? What comes to mind is this, what comes to my mind is this. People are being led like sheep to the slaughter. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the transcendentalist? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. I can't say that, sheep to the slaughter. I want to go sleep to the slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> but are we smart sheep? Right. We're here in this seminar to decipher and discuss what's happening in this generation and what God's allowing to happen in these end times in order to bring about his glorious plan of redemption and to bring in his kingdom on earth the way it was always meant to be. So now I want to get on, and i got to go fast. I only have a few verses. Uh, with our study in Matthew 24, we ended at verse 30 right before the fig tree.